If you have your Bible, please open with me to 1 Samuel chapter 19. Now, we've been going through the story, and, and we talked about how David is on the run, right? And last week, we talked about how David's on the run from, um, from Saul. And he first escaped through, through Saul's son. So he had provision for protection from family members. And secondly, he found escape through his wife, who was Saul's daughter-in-law. And I talked about how God provided deliverance and protection for each one of them through their gifts, you know, as man, as woman, as a friend, as a wife. Well, it wasn't enough. See, he had to run. And he will be running for a long, long time. Now, here's the problem. Where is he going to turn to? You see, God has always, if you think about the work of God, God has always set up his people into a community, such as our church, different groups. You know, even within that groups, we have different groups, like teenage girls, all set row two and three. Teenage boys always sit behind the teenage girls. And all, you know, we have the all different sections, right? We have our groups of friends. This is good. And because we're always made for community. Here's the problem. What if in your obedience to God, you find that you're all alone? Like in your obedience to God, trying to do God's will, you're actually, in a sense, you have no one else to turn to. And in a sense, this is where the situation that David found himself. You see, though, under the Old Covenant, under the Old Testament, the whole nation of Israel is supposed to be God's community. Right? If you remember back in Exodus, when God may reach out to them at Mount Sinai and give them the Ten Commandments, he says what? You are to be my people, my priests. And in the book of Deuteronomy, he, he actually said to Moses, to his people, he says that I want the world to see this people, what good law, what good statutes have been given by God from above to this people. And people are to look at the nation of Israel and to see what a wonderful society this is. And they are to be an example to the nations around them. That hasn't changed, by the way, brothers and sisters. Here in the New Covenant, it's no longer bound to the nation of Israel. It's bound to the church of Christ, of which we are part of. You know, one of the most amazing thing is that if you read the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3 actually says this, that God established church, the church so that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the heavenly authorities. This means, at the very minimum, when the angels look down, for example, when the angels look down at CCCM, they should be able to say, oh man, this is so cool. Look at them, they're all worshiping God together. And look at them, they're all using their gifts in different ways. You know, art, engineering, youth group, music, leading worship, Bible study, 
All these things leading people to Christ. And look at this. They all come from different backgrounds, different circumstances. But look at how they love each other. That's how it's supposed to work. But see, sometimes the system breaks down. And we have a very good example of the system breaking down. Here's a man who's called what? A man after God's own heart, and he's on the run because the king wants to kill him. Now, how did the breakdown happen? The breakdown, in fact, actually happened, I said this, mentioned this before, back in chapter 16. See, back in chapter 16, back in chapter 15, when the, um, the throne was taken away from Saul, and then instead of the, um, the spirit of God, he had an evil spirit in him. And the elders of God's people saw that. What did they say? They said, this man, this king has an evil spirit in him. It was the elder's job to actually call him to repentance or actually remove him from the throne. But instead, they put, they put a band-aid job on him. Let's say, they say what? Let's get a musician. Let's get a guy who can play mellow music, jazz music, to help come for him. And so what? They didn't deal with the problem. And so the problem becomes larger. And to the point, David has to run for his life. Let me just say this real quickly. This is, um, this is where we can talk about leadership. The elders of the church, including pastors, have a very important responsibility to keep, I will say the purity of the church or keep the, um, the church to function the way God's supposed to, wants it to function. And this is a very important job to help keep the church. That's why we have shepherds and guides in our churches to help us to do so. Now, I know most of you are not elders. And it's, it's, sometimes it's easy for us to kind of point fingers and blame. And because we're the English congregation, a lot of times we say, well, that's a Chinese job, that's a Chinese job. But let me speak to you, especially men for a woman, because that's where the calling for elders are. And it's this, we are going to be held responsible we have been given authority in different areas, whether large or small. At the very minimum, for us guys, dudes who are married, well, authority in our homes. And that's where we are to exercise that in a good, loving way to build up your family. But you expand that into the household of God. And we have responsibilities. But what do men like to do? Come on, what do us men like to do? I guess I'm Chinese background. I can only speak for myself, but what do I ask the Chinese men like to do? Come on, guys. I like to hide behind my wife. <laughs> and make her do the hard work. And maybe sometimes that's why we have such strong women in our churches. But we are called. There's a responsibility. And the elders there have given up this responsibility. So you have a man who's all alone. But he's not alone. Because I want to share with you in this passage. In the remaining time I want to share is that what happens when there's a breakdown. Is that the spirit of God will step in. And the Spirit of God will step in wonderfully, marvelously to save and to humble. Now, this is not to say, the tendency when I say this is that, you know, most people, what happens? They don't 
there's a what's there's a there's a tendency today let me just say this it's called what i love jesus but i hate the church right we all know people like that i love jesus i hate the church and and what happens when that because you don't have sometimes you don't get along with people and all he says is all i need is the holy spirit here's the problem the holy spirit of god gives a deliverance to david but this deliverance was temporary. It was done at the end of 19. So the God, God, the Holy Spirit gives the deliverance, but what God wants and what God gives the church to do is to fulfill her function. And that's what we're called to do, okay? So don't get this wrong. A mentality here but let me let me go into the passage real quick let me just talk a little bit about the ministry what what you do what David does the first thing during this time is that the Holy Spirit of God gave a ministry of rest look at verse 18 with me now David fled and escaped this phrase is going to come up over and over and over throughout this chapter. He's running. He's on the run. Saul's trying to kill him. And he came to Samuel Abrama and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and lived at Naal. I love this passage because David was on the run. He's on the run against this man. Saul, who's basically passive aggressive. You know, he promised on one hand, he promised Jonathan, he says, I will not take his life. And he turned around and tried to kill David. You know, and he, he praised people who found David for him. And he's nice. And then he, and then he goes after David. And he was just about the only one who actually could figure out this man's heart was his daughter, Michael. So here's David, seen as a fugitive. Nowhere else to turn to. Goes to Samuel. He goes to Samuel, and he can pour out his heart. And you know, at the end of the day, If we're ever in a situation in a closed country where you have no one to worship, there's always someone you can turn to, and that's God. You see, the prophet Samuel represents, he represents the prophet, prophetic tradition, the word of God. And he came and poured out everything to him. And, and then the, the scripture tells us he and Samuel went and lived at Naoth. And basically, literally, it's the passage says he walked. For a man who's been running, 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 he can walk with a friend. And not only can he walk with a friend, he actually has a place to dwell. And the place to dwell is actually called Naoth. Now, if you look at most Bible dictionary, most Bible dictionaries will say they don't know where exactly this place Naoth is. Now, this place, in, in fact, it's probably, um, it could be translated as building, or it could be translated as pasture. And as we go on later on in the story, you'll find this, there's a group of prophets and what, what Samuel probably did was he started a school for the prophets. Do you guys remember? Okay, come back with me for a second. Back in chapter 2. Back in chapter 2, what was the introduction of Samuel? What did the scripture say? Back in before in the introduction of um, Samuel, it says what? In those days, the word of God was rare. There was no frequent vision. People didn't have the word of God. So what Samuel did was that he was building up 
I believe, a school of prophets to proclaim the word of God. One of the best gifts that God has given to us, I think it's this. If I go up past and I start teaching false things, if everyone around you start believing it, you still have one weapon. And that's the most powerful weapon ever. What's that weapon? Mike, what's the weapon? Want to say it? It's the word of God. Come on, Sunday school answer. I don't even ask Sunday school questions. The answer is always either Jesus or Bible. Okay, so the, the answer is the Bible. The Bible is a gift that God has given to you. As David said, Though my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. And I remember there are times in my life, you know, when I was actually, after I became a Christian, I was back in Taiwan, and I was actually, my parents were going to a liberal, very liberal church. And I really, had, I have no idea what that meant. But I just know that when I went to Sunday school, the teacher would get up and said, you know, the, prop, the miracle of 5,000, uh, the feeding of 5,000, you know what that was? It was just Jesus taking a loaf of bread and just start breaking it up and passing it around. And everyone around him were touched by what Jesus did, so they took out their own bread and fish and passed it around. So they denied, the teacher denied the miracle of God. And I knew there's something wrong. But I was really young, I couldn't really figure it out. But what God actually did was that, you know, I had the word of God to turn to. And the word of God is actually, in a sense, my rest. So here, David found refreshment. You all could as well. There are always times throughout history... Sometimes when the church was about to go totally heresy. And God raised someone, like a man, Martin Luther, to bring about reading the Bible. The fact that we actually read our Bible in our English language is something that, that most people can't take for granted. Okay? So first of all, God, the Spirit, provides the Word. And why do I tie the Spirit of God with the Word of God? Because Ephesians 6 tells us this. When you talk about the full armor of God, one offensive weapon we have is what? The sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. So today, friends, we have the one weapon that God's given to us. Let's say if you're ever to the point that you have to run on your own, one thing that you still have is the Word of God. So don't ever forget this. Secondly, let's talk about the deliverance by the Spirit of God. The deliverance by the Spirit of God. Here God does a supernatural work. And this is actually found in verse 19. And it was told Saul, behold, David is at Na Naoth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as head over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul and they also prophesied. Now, what, what happened there? You can just picture that. These were probably the same messengers that originally last week we talked about was actually called to take David out of Michael's house. These was David's, I mean Saul's headmen. They were like henchmen, thugs. 
And they, they heard the message, they went, and they can't wait to get him. But what happened in, instead? They came, and they saw this vision. Before they even got to David, before they, they can even see David, they saw a company of prophets prophesying. And not only that, but above them. Samuel was somehow, I think, he was, um, he was glorified. Standing above them with great authority. And that vision threw these men down. And they started prophesying. We don't know exactly what they said. But the picture itself is clear. It's what? It is when the heavens thrown open. And there's going to be a vision of the glory of God that they cannot help but bow down. You know what's going to happen in the last day? Scripture tells us what's going to happen is this. That every knee will bow down to Jesus. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Stalin's going to be there. Hitler's going to be there. Mao's going to be there. And I don't think some angel's going to have to push down. Get down, get down, get down. Because you know why? Because when they see the glory of God, they will realize what a speck of dust they truly are. And they will bow down. And they will worship. And the same thing happened. You know, one of the best things that God could do to us is to open our eyes. Open our eyes to see where we're at. You know, sometimes I just, I get so frustrated. The world we're at, entertainment media we're at, is everything's anti-God. You know, I, I like movies. Um, I like and don't like scary movies. And so what do I do? I don't watch the movie, I just read the Wikipedia version of it, right? You cheat. But you like these stories. But you know, after a while, I just realized, man, some of the stuff is so bad. And it seems like we in the church are small. And we can't face what's in real life. All it takes, brothers and sisters, just a little bit for the Spirit of God to throw open and for our eyes to see. You see, every one of us one day will bow our knees to Jesus. It's either we do it willingly now or we will do it involuntarily. And so what God does is to put that fear into the hearts of his people. Okay, this happened second, third time. You know, Saul th kept thinking he can do it. He can do it. He sent them all, and they kept prophesying. So what happens? Saul goes. And here I want to tell you, the spirits, not only that, but the Holy Spirit, what he can do is that he can utterly humiliate us. Look at Saul. Saul decides to go himself. Now think with me for a moment. If he sent all his great soldiers to, and he's like, hmm, I see a pattern there. Everyone's prophesying. If you're saying next to Paul, Saul, what would you say? Don't go there. 
You're going to get in trouble. But Saul went, why? We can say he's stupid, he's arrogant, as all those, but there's another reason. And the other reason is this. Saul has done this before. Remember, back in chapter 9, when he was called to be a king, and one of the signs that was given to him was that he was going to prophesy. In fact, he did such a great job that he, people were saying, he's among the prophets. Isn't Saul also among the prophets? So I think in the back of his mind, he had this thought, I can do it and I can get away with it. Because what? I've done it before. You see, sometimes in our rebellion against God, and we can do that even as Christians. We can say, you know what? I had, that, had an experience with God before. Therefore, I'm safe. Look at what happened. He goes, let me just read the scripture. Then he himself went to Ramah and came to the great world that is in Seku. And he asked, where is Samuel and David? And someone said, behold, they are at Naoth and Ramah. And, and to me, that seems like a very insignificant fact. Why did you record that? It's recorded for us for a very special reason. Because back then, when Saul was about to be king, he also came, I believe, in the same city, Rama. He came to the same city, and he was looking for Samuel. He didn't know where Samuel was. But he walked up and he saw a woman carrying a jar to give water. And this is probably the most likely the same well. And the woman led him to Samuel. And his life was changed for the better. And I think that Saul probably had the same idea. He's saying, you know what? I am just going to go to God. I am just actually going to have the same experience. I am going to conquer. I am going to get to do what I want to do. So the same thing happened. He had a choice to make. He's emboldened. I am going to stop him. But what happened? Wham! That man was stopped. It's funny, if you read the story, even before he got to Rama, the Spirit of God hit him. You see this? And he went there to Naoth and Ramah. And the Spirit of God came to him also. And as he went, he prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah. So right after he left the well somewhere, before he even got there, he started prophesying. Imagine how hard he fought against God. He's walking, and he feels like his lips is quivering. He knew it was coming. What does he want to do? No, shut my mouth. I had him. You know, King Saul thought he was a great man. He was the king of Israel. He was the king over God's people. He thought, you know, he had the team to go to the Super Bowl. But he got there, he realized he's got a high school team going against the Green Bay Packers. Crushed. Destroyed. And what happened? Even more, he says this. Doesn't all stop there. He says, he too stripped off his clothes. And he too prophesied before Samuel and lay naked all that day and all that night. I don't think all the other soldiers that happened to other soldiers. He says he also, meaning he's actually, he literally, he also did this. In addition to prophesying, he took off his clothes. And he lay naked all day and night. 
talk about emperor without his clothes on. You know how you know you grew up, you, you reach maturity? It's by your nightmares. When I was a kid, my worst nightmare was being chased by ghosts, being chased by animals, being chased by beasts. You know what my nightmare now is? And you guys all had this. You stand before a group of people and realize you're naked. Uh huh. All right, Peter. All right, you, uh, you had that. That's a scary, scary thing. You see, what happens when we stand against God? When we think that we can conquer God, when we abuse, let's say you abuse God, use this church, you abuse God, it's God that's going to smack you. It's us. And put us in our place. And last of all, it's, the joke is actually funny. Thus it is said, uh, Saul also among the prophets. You know, the first time this is used, it was actually Saul getting glorified. And here he's debased. He's humiliated. He's beaten up. You know, this speaks to our hearts. Are you a Christian? It's easy sometimes for us to just act, play the act, play the role. To take advantage of people of the church. But ultimately, you know what? God will get the last laugh. God will get the last laugh in our lives. Or this is also, this says a lot about pride. How you will use your pride. And when you're pr proud, God will humble you. So God did provide a deliverance to his servants. You know, and here, here again, this is outside the church too. Ultimately, one day, all will be seen plainly. And it's what we do for Christ that will last forever. Where are you? Where is your service for God? Where is your heart, let me say? Or are you just going through the motion? I've been baptized. Yay! That means I'm a Christian. What is your fruit? At the end of the day, it's just, these are the only two choices we have. With them, or we're not with them. We can try to fake we're with them. But God will have the last laugh. And it's a comforting thought that God will build his church. It may not be the church in America, friends. We need to be faithful to the Lord. God will build his church elsewhere. Maybe it's going to be in China, Africa, South America. But we are called to be faithful to him. So let's do that. Let me, let's pray together. Father God, we thank you. Thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we always have a place to go. Father, you said that you...